Congratulations, you have read the entirety of the book of Colossians in worship over the last weeks. Uh, having heard that, I invite you to go ahead and turn to Colossians 4 in a Bible if you have one handy, or your smartphone app, because aren't they useful? Last week, Paul reached the conclusion of the argument of the letter, what we now call Colossians, having laid the foundation that everything happens, that God is the one who begins it, that then we, we accept that, we are receiving the gifts that God pours out, that we do not add anything to it, but that in accepting what God pours out, we are being transformed, and that transformation begins in our homes, and our closest relationships, as we practice mutual submission to each other. Now that's sort of the line of the letter, that's the line of argument. And uh, I must say, of this, I, I, I've made a personal commitment. I will preach every book in the Bible before I retire. And uh, once more, I picked, I knew nothing about Colossians other than it was a letter. And uh, it's been really good. I've enjoyed it. And Paul has completed his argument, and so here we are. It's not done yet. What's Paul, what, what does Paul have left to do? Well, he changes gears, and instead of like continuing a line of thought, he has a few last reminders. As I was reading this, I was thinking of a friend of mine who recently dropped off his uh, youngest daughter at college. And in thinking of those moments, like when you're dropping someone off, there's that moment when, okay, Dad, it's time for you to leave the room, and I'm going to stay here at college, and you're going to leave. Like, what do you say in that moment? Like, we, we all have those moments at some time, that point at which you walk out onto the, the porch and you're going to drive away to your new home or new job or you're going to go enlist or, or whatever it is you're about to go do and you're not coming home for a while. What's your mama say to you in that moment? Right? We've all had those moments, right? What, e either been on the receiving end of them or said them ourselves, and you're fumbling to find the right words for what to say. And uh, this is kind of where Paul is at with the, the church at Colossae. Paul is imprisoned. He will probably, if he is freed, he will probably never make it back far enough. He's not a young man at this point. And so these are his last words to the, the church at Colossae. And so here are his last sentence. What can he say? And so what do you say in those type of moments? It obviously depends upon the situation. Uh, dropping off 18-year-old Andy, I don't know exactly what my mother said, but I am sure it included something like, remember to do your laundry, because I was not known for keeping track of such matters over my previous 18 years, and that was a fitting thing to remind me of. Of, or make sure not to study too hard. That, that was fitting for me. But to others, you would say, make sure to study at all. Right? What, what is said depends on... There, there's only so much that goes into what you say. There's so much history. There's echoes of, of the years you have together. That, that is, uh, if someone's being deployed, being enlisted, and you might, some, to some people, you might make sure to say, stay safe, because you, you know exactly how rambunctious and risk-taking they might be. And so in such moments, there are these echoes and inside jokes of all that has gone before. And that's what we're looking for as we read through these last comments of Paul. And what Paul and the church at Colossae have in common, their short shared story, is the story of the early church. They know a lot of the same people, and they share the story of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're listening for. We read in chapter 2, Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God may open up to us a door so that we might speak the mystery of Christ, for which I have been imprisoned, in order that I might make it clear. Asking people to be devoted to prayer and keeping alert... In the story of Jesus Christ, there's a particular moment that comes to mind when you talk about staying alert. It's in Mark 14. When Jesus has gone to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane before he is crucified that next day, he goes to pray, and what does he say to his disciples? Keep alert and he, pray with me as I go off to pray. And then he comes back, and what have the disciples gone? 
they're snoozing, right? And so he says, can, I, you, can you not stay alert with me for this time, right, please? And then he goes off to pray again, he comes back, and the disciples are snoozing. And, uh, and, and so this is to say, keep alert in prayer is a comment with just a touch of bite to it. Can you please stay alert? We've learned this lesson, haven't we, as followers of Jesus, that it is easy to doze off. Can you stay alert, and can you stay alert with an attitude of thanksgiving? Paul has gone through this whole letter and this theme that we are receiving and we are receiving and we are receiving and that is what transforms our lives. We tra we are transformed by receiving the grace of Christ, by coming to the table, by receiving the gifts that we offer each other. Can you be attentive and alert to be thankful? How often do our prayers descend into what is broken or what is wrong or what we need? And, and so what Paul cautions them is be alert to start in thanksgiving. Be thankful for all that you have. Be thankful for all that has happened. Be thankful. Focus on all the gifts that have poured down upon you. Can you start with that. There will always be something to complain about. Always. Like, we, we live this side of the kingdom of heaven. We're not to heaven yet. And so there will always be something broken. Instead of focusing on that, have this attitude of thanksgiving, looking for those things that we can be thankful for. And then pray for us. Now, Paul is imprisoned in, or he's in a house, uh, house arrest, Roman prison. And if you were arrested by the Romans, what would you be asking people to pray for you for? A good lawyer, right? F getting free. Like, what would you be pray praying for? That's what I'd be thinking to pray for. What does Paul ask for prayers? He continues in this attitude of thanksgiving. He says, pray for me that doors might be opened, that I might proclaim the mystery of Christ. Right? He is being thankful that he is meeting these new people. Like, instead of being down, man, I've got to deal with the jailers, I'm in prison, he is being thankful, I get to tell the, ja the, the jailers about Jesus. It's an amazing attitude to practice. I mean, we see him practicing this attitude uh, of thanksgiving, and, and he's praying, open doors so I can keep on doing what got me in trouble in the first place. Paul's a very bold dude. That's impressive. And so he, he is praying for this, and he is praying that they might, he might be able to share the mystery of Christ. And if there is one thing, that phrase, that really captures what we share, this is it. Because it's a mystery. The mystery, I mean, if you look across all of Scripture, you find mystery after mystery after mystery. The mysteries of creation. God created this beautiful world that we, we enjoy. And do we, do we understand the world fully? Nope. There are great mysteries to this world. And, and then we have the mystery of the incarnation. Right? We have this, the mysteries we celebrate it every Christmas. The, the feast of the incarnation is, is the fullness of the word for the, the, the Christmas. The, the technical term, I guess you'd say. And... Um, Incarnation, And I can tell you the textbook answer that the incarnation is when God became fully human, taking on flesh to be with us. And I, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about when I say that. No, I don't understand it. It's a mystery. God became human. It's a mystery. I don't get it. Like, we talk about the mystery of baptism, that we are accepted into the family and washed and made clean. How does it work? It's a mystery. We come to this table and we celebrate communion, this holy mystery. We come to this table and, and we are given bread that becomes the body of Christ and, and the cup that is full of the blood of Christ that we might partake of our salvation and be bound together as the church. How does it work? Mystery. The word for baptism and, sac uh, baptism and communion, we call them the sacraments. It's the Latin term. I really wish we kept the Greek term because the Greek term for them was mysterion. Mysteries. The mysteries of Christ. When Paul talks about going out and sharing the mysteries of Christ, I think that is a, the right way to approach it. Because if we're going to open doors and go out and share, the mystery, share mysteries, Paul's not going out so he can lecture and expound upon data. Mysteries are not things that are understood. They are, they are experienced and shared and hinted at and struggled with and accepted. There are mysteries of faith that I do not understand, but I accept them and I experience them and I am thankful for them. Paul then prays that 
Asked that they might pray for him, that he might share these mysteries clearly. You'd think a guy who has been doing this for decades would have got it down now. No, he is aware that there's always something more to learn, which is impressive on his part. We read in the next verse, Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. So, y'all are inside right now, right? And so if you are inside, by definition, there are people who are outside. And so Paul is saying, be wise and take every opportunity when you are outside. Because we need to be wise, because people see us in certain ways. In the first century, the way that Christians were seen, they were accused of being atheists, because you could not see the God they worshipped, and they said that this is the only God. And if you were a neighbor who worshipped Apollo or Venus or something like that, and your Christian neighbor said that that God didn't exist, well, what would you call? You'd call that person an atheist. Like, you deny my God, and I can't see your God. What is wrong with you? And and to this day, the church full of insides, uh, insiders, us Christians, we, we are seen in certain ways. What is the most common charge leveled against the church? Hypocrisy, right? Is that we, we, act, we say one thing and we go out and we act another way. And so what Paul says to us as people who go outside into a world that does not always see us uh, truthfully is to conduct ourselves wisely, to make the most out of the opportunities we have when we go out there. And in the context of a letter that has been talking about thankfulness and all that we receive again and again, it strikes me that if Paul was to continue this line of thought, he would probably start quoting Jesus in Luke 6, 638, when Paul went up. Jesus talks about how we receive a cup, and in, into our cup it overflows, packed down full overflowing grain, so that if you just let that continue to overflow, as you go out into the world, if we are receiving fully from Jesus Christ our Lord, we don't need to worry that we're going, we're going to run out. Right? We're going to be able to go out, and, and as we have received from Christ who pours our, himself out for us, we can go out into the world and wisely pour out ourselves for others, trusting that there will always be more. And, and what are we pouring out? I don't think it's stuff. Like Paul and Jesus were not talking about how if we look up, God will pour down a plethora of all of the things you might want, because what we most need are not things. What we most need and what we are given are the things like joy and hope and laughter and grace. And so to go out in the world and to pour ourselves out wisely, have you ever noticed how laughter can infect a whole room? Right? How, how joy can, can just spread across an entire space. To go out and to be joyous and hopeful and laughter and grace. To be the most gracious person in the room. Right? Let, your speech always, let your speech always be with grace, Paul continues. Seasoned as it were with salt, so that you might know how you should respond to each person. There's an unfortunate change that's happened in the last couple centuries, because if I ask you for your language to be salty, you would say to me, we're in church, Andy. Because <laughs> salty refers to salt water, pirates, swearing like a sailor, etc. That's not what Paul's getting at. Salt in the first century was hard to come by. Which is hard to imagine, because we live in a time when, what does the doctor say to everyone? More exercise, drink more water, less salt, right? In Paul's time, there wasn't, they couldn't get enough salt. This was an issue. And so salt was a commodity, and it was a commodity that preserved. If you have salt and you can salt your meat, it prevented the meat from corrupting, from rotting. And so to, to have something be salty was for it to be, have that smack of, you know, you put a little salt in a dish that has no salt. All of a sudden you go, yeah, that's good. That's what Paul is talking about here. Be, let, your, let your language be salty and that it is graceful. It is true. It is a gift. You speak and someone has that same sense of, that, that, that's good. I like that. Right? That, that, that's the gift. And, and do this so that, Paul tells us why to do this. Paul does this so that you might know how to respond to people. Paul has been working with churches for years, and I am certain that one thing about human character has not changed. 
If I ask people to go out into the world and invite people to church or talk about church or talk about their faith, what, what anyone want to guess what's the thing I hear most often? What if they ask a question? I don't know what I'll say. This is Paul telling you what to say. Be graceful. Be true. If someone asks a question, what do you tell them? Do you know the answer or you do not know the answer? You just tell them what you know, right? Just be graceful, be true. Be salty so that you might know how you should respond to each person and trust that the mystery of Christ is deep enough. If someone tells you, I'm not sure why you're part of the church, I don't understand this, you tell them best you can and say, come to church and find out yourself. What then follows are his final set of comments to the people in the church. And it's like the begats in the Old Testament. Anyone here fall asleep during a set of begats? I have. Multiple times. Same passage, right? I have done it, right? You start reading so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. And, you th and that's what Paul's talking here. He's giving a list of names. I want you to give thanks to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And what's the temptation? Let's just skip it. Right? I read this passage when I, I'm reading through Colossians. I know how Colossians ends. I re read this at the end and thought, my temptation? Let's go preach Philemon. Let's just, I mean, I'm tempted to skip it myself. But I think it's important to pause and stop. Because if nothing else, we need to acknowledge that Paul is not speaking esoterically out into the eye either. This is not like him writing down some notes and then just like sending it off for whoever wants to read it. Paul is writing to his friends in Colossae. Right? And we know their names. We know Nympha. We know Demos. We know these people that he is naming. He is, this is a conversation amongst friends and family. Right? Paul, and, and it's important to know that because Paul is saying some things that are hard to hear. He is challenging them. And you, to go up to the street and go to a ra random stranger and to challenge their understanding of their faith would be rude. What Paul is doing is, is saying, as a family, we can have these conversations. And so as a family, let me make sure to greet you in the, in the end, make sure we all are reminded that we are our family. And so we'll, we'll plow through these, and some of them I know, and some of them I don't. It's interesting. There's, you know how when you mention someone's name in a family gathering, sometimes people go, yeah, because everyone knows the history? That's what we're about to do. But as we go through this, he mentions, as in verse 7, Tychicus, who will tell you what's up and where I'm at. I know nothing about Tychicus. Sorry. Uh, but then on, with him comes Onesimus, your fa our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. Now, Onesimus, that's interesting. Because the, the next book is Philemon. And Philemon is, this, is what Paul writes to a dude in Colossae about his slave, Onesimus. And so, last time this gathering of people saw Onesimus, he was Philemon's slave, and he ran away. And so Philemon probably came during the joys and concerns and said, my slave ran away, right? This was part of, this was a big to-do. And Onesimus, Onesimus runs away, and he meets Paul, and now he's showing back up, and Paul writes to them and says, he is one of you. And they look around and think, wait a minute, I thought he was a slave. He's one of us? Hmm. And it says, they have much to tell you. Yes, they do, right? It continues in verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, I got nothing on him. But then he comes, but also Barnabas' cousin, Mark. Now, Mark is interesting because you ever get angry at your spouse and then tell your friend? And then you make up with your spouse because you just have to. Who's still angry? Your friend. That's what's happening here. Paul and uh, Mark have had a very public falling out. It's such a public falling out that we have the record of it in Acts. They had a complete throwdown, and Paul looked at Mark and said, you're out of here, buddy. You don't travel with me anymore. And they went their separate ways, literally. Like, they traveled in opposite directions. So Paul and Mark have lost it on each other. And here is Paul writing them and saying, now Mark's going to be heading your way. And I know you took my side... 
when we had this fight earlier, but I want you to remember what he writes to them. If he comes to you, welcome him. Don't you dare hold a grudge. That's not how this family works. You welcome Mark, because he, he and I, we're, we're getting along, we're doing fine. Then he continues and says, Epiphras, verse 12, sends you his greeting, he is always praying for you. Epiphras is the guy who started the church with Paul's help, and then he's the guy who goes to Paul and has Paul write the letter back. And so if you're in this church, and you've just gotten a letter that's told you what's up, and you're a little bit annoyed, who are you annoyed at? Epiphras, because he's the guy who snitched on you to Paul. And so here's Paul saying, now don't you dare get angry at your uncle Epiphras. He is doing what is good for you. He's doing good. You just, you just chill. You don't get angry at him. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. Yes, it is that Luke. Luke, the gospel of Luke. As does Demos. I have no clue who Demos is. Greet the brethren, including Nympha. Nympha is a lady who opened her church, opened her house to become the church. Like, it's in the first century. They haven't built churches yet. And so Nympha is a lady who, who has welcomed them all into their house so that they can worship somewhere. And when this letter is read among you, read it to the Laodiceans and then go get their letter. I don't know why. And then we have the last sentence of the book. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Paul usually writes an extended sort of something. But he's imprisoned. So his hand is padlocked. He's in handcuffs to the soldier to make sure he doesn't run. And so he has to like tell the soldier, hey guy, can, I, can, you, can, you, can I sign this please? And like dashes off the last line and he finishes. He can only write this one thing. So what does he write? He writes the same thing he started with. The, the beginning of the letter was grace to you in peace, and the end of the letter is grace to you. Same ending. That's the thing he can most wish upon them. So Paul, I mean, he's done it. Like Paul, if when you're when you're saying goodbye to someone you love, you're going, they're going to college, or they're going on a trip, or they're moving away, whatever it is. I can't say that that you can be very coherent in what you say like think of the last time you wish someone goodbye it's not like you'd have like a coherent through line of you i want to say a b c d you just kind of say that what comes to mind what comes most important to you and that's what paul has done be thankful be, be, be people of prayer who are thankful and be thankful for this family that's gathered around you and i want to tell you a little bit about the people you are thankful for and, and it is it is not, this was not how I planned the week, but it sure did work out well. Because this week, I can tell you that I had that experience this week. I, I spent most of Wednesday, uh, Wednesday morning drinking coffee with the people of this church. And then Wednesday afternoon, we studied uh, the, the Gospel of Mark. In an hour, we read 40 verses. That's awesome. We are really enjoying this. And, and please come and join us this Wednesday at 1 and 6, because the more the merrier. And then Thursday, I went and I had coffee with pastors in the area uh, who are new to the area. And, and I could get like very practical and tell you the very practical things I learned about each, of, uh, each person and what we're going to do together. But in reality, the best part about this week was simply to be family. Like to be family with the people who follow Jesus together. I am so deeply thankful for that. And, and so I would encourage you to do exactly that as Paul uh, talks about, to be attentive to that which you can give thanks for. And I think the greatest thing that we can give thanks for sometimes is simply to look around and look at the people next to you. You are surrounded by the saints. You are surrounded by amazing, beautiful people who love you. Can you love on each other this week? Can you be thankful for each other? Drink some coffee together? Amen.